because I feel like good stuff will come through. And mm -hmm. we will just wait on the one clue blurs. So how are you? I am. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. The you hair is looking working. fabulous. Thank you. I had to let it down tonight. Yes. <laughs> but wait, can we talk about how your, last week. Your, your, your niece was like, why is Auntie Sarah hair like that? As they were watching last week. Not the babies. The babies. <laughs> It the was babies like, wasn't messing around. They wasn't like, feeling it. What's going on while I hear? I said it's called a doobie rap. I need y'all to understand these things. This yeah, is part I, had of to, I had to. I had just come out the hairdresser. The doobie was was just right. I had to leave it. I couldn't. I couldn't take it down because I can't replicate that. Yeah, it's hard. I can't replicate that. So I was like, nah. It yeah. is. It is. So mm -mm. it was perfect. I'm gonna leave it right where it is. I, you know, I took the scarf off <laughs> and I put them headphones on, and we just we made it do. Hello. Do. Hello. Sorry. Are we getting this? Oh. Hey. Right. Hey. Wait. Wait. Hold up. What? Where's the? Where's the suit? Today was a work day. Okay. Because you look like a hacker. We got this. Like hacker. You're getting this. You're, you're getting. You're getting we talk in cybersecurity. Well, analytics, <laughs> machine learning. I'm in the mode. I'm in the zone. You're in the zone. Okay. Well, welcome back. It's Hi. another Ask Serena Live after show. We have made it to a second show. We're being consistent. I feel like this is good. I feel like there's momentum, right? Yeah. I'm excited. I didn't get the time wrong. I was like ready at nine and not 10 at central time. Like Amazing. last year. I, so like, you, we should, like, let's just talk about your last year. I, I'm proud of you. I really am. I'm proud of you this year. I feel like you, you're making some forward movements because, you know, I had this guy's support for like years and then all of a sudden, like, you're like, wait, you were on? No, I was on at like nine o'clock, bruh. Eastern Standard Time. I understand that you're a Southerner now. I get this. I, I sincerely do. But like, you're from New York. I listen, mean, listen, listen. You know, you gotta embrace the culture. And uh, no, what was killing me last year was I would be ready to go like nine or ten on Wednesday night. And that I'd was be like, the other piece. Yeah, and I would sit there and I'm like clicking, like, what? We just not going live, Janine? This is just not a thing? And then I like text you feeling super righteous and fiery and spicy, and I would play myself. But, Every know, time. It worked Every out. Time. Every time. Every time. <laughs> without fail. Or like I would get on at 11, and it, I guess it's 10 my time. time. It just. Uh, it was a lot. So, so let's let's look at it in the positive. You were urging. Okay. You were the ghost of time past, urging, right. urging me and pushing me towards a new time. I just didn't see it. So now I'm at 10 p.m. So right, all is well in the world. It's yeah. All this is what I, I, was in the, I was living in the future. That's all. I saw the vision. I'm glad you caught it. Ah. There we go. See, there's always an upside. I gotta give you shit, and then I and then I gotta smooth it out. Because we're. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Get right. looking now. So, guys, I feel like we did introductions last week about how we all met, but you know, I don't. I want you guys to kind of just tell everybody like who you are and who you represent, real quick, and then we'll just like hop into some commentary. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I'm Sarah Morgan. I am the Chief Excellence Officer of Buzzerini LLC, which is a human resources management consulting firm. Um, I do blogging at the Buzz on HR. I'll be launching a podcast called Leading in Color in about three weeks. Um, and then I also do consulting and speaking and writing pretty much I feel like everywhere right now so um connect with me at the buzz on HR on all social media that's the way to find me and yeah that's it about me strong J strong J yes I love that chief excellence officer I, I, I like this dope 
Um, okay, I'm Dr. Paul McNeil. This is professional, so I'm going to share my professional Twitter, which is uh, at Usable Set Guy, uh, founder of MV Usable Security. And we do, we create usable security and integrate um, security solutions that use machine learning, as well as integrate with your marketing plan so that you can be secure and make revenue. Uh, and that's, that's it for what I'm doing over here, I guess. You know, I, I am I'm trying to get into speaking. I haven't done it too much, but you know, let me know if you want want something uh interesting to make it happen. Indeed, indeed. So guys, talk to me. Where are you at on cybersecurity? What are your thoughts about where we're at with it? What which would we need to be doing? What are your issues with it? Full disclosure, I tried to take notes like Sarah last week, so I was like, have my phone out, but I kept cutting out um, throughout the talk, so I may ask questions or say some stuff because I miss things. That's why I be, I be analog with my notes. See, I got a little, I got a little sheet. No, no, I mean the video, the video, I couldn't, like, um, Janine, you were cutting out for me. I don't know why, it was weird. I was refreshing a million times. Uh, I like, saw you yeah, guys have that popping too. on and off, but like the video yeah. was continuous, but I saw people popping on and off. So. Yeah, so I was like, I was like, oh man, I was like, I have my notes, I was ready to go. I had one question, you were talking about vendors mm -hmm. pulling something, they keep pulling something with like PII stuff, and I was like, what is she saying? Oh, um, yeah, so I was talking about how um, my, my experience has been that when we're um, implementing onboarding systems specifically it's not so much an issue with applicant tracking systems because really at that point we're only pulling like demographic information the, the very least mm -hmm. um but when you get to the onboarding piece it's like that's the information you're going to use to actually hire them into mm -hmm. the his system mm -hmm. and so then you start getting into like social security numbers date of births and other things that like obviously people don't want to be exposed and what I've found is they will encrypt at rest, but they will mm -hmm. not encrypt in transit. Gotcha. And that, like, so where, for the sectors where I worked, I worked in, you know, federal contractor, which is basically government. And then prior to that, healthcare, those are highly, highly regulated industries. So at the point that we're talking RFPs and stuff, and we're going through the whole security piece, everything looks good from how they store it to how, what their SLAs are. Like it's all good until we get to implementation and find out like, Oh, so you're not encrypting in transit. Well, this is a problem. So now we just dropped like 500 grand on this new system and we're having to create workarounds before we even get started in the system or we're not in, we're not in a position to actually implement at all because your IT is shutting it down. Like, no, we just can't do this. This is a risk. So I was saying, you know, vendors who want to do this on a, on the low, low and just slide in the DMS and help me understand why it's come off their roadmap because many of them had it. Um, when we first started doing the whole SAS implementation thing. And then for whatever reason, something shifted and i don't know if that was just a security something like in general in the in the industry it just came off the roadmap and basically as a customer you had to make a whole lot of noise about it for them to then say like oh yeah okay we'll put it back on the roadmap because now the their business or your five or four year deal is on the line and so yo know, it's just better to tell them like yeah we'll put it on the roadmap but that roadmap be like 12 months 24 oh, months or never yeah. or never they yeah. will string you around i think the road, that, yeah. that, oh, the, wow. road, the roadmap is a joke like I, I i it's one of the phrases i hate to hear from tech vendors the most it's like oh we'll put this on our road it is the road to nowhere <laughs> if the road is constantly recalculating you're never getting you never get where it is that you're supposed to go and to me it's just a way of saying yeah we hear you but we don't hear you or we, we hear you, but we don't feel you. And I'm just not, I'm not, oh, I can't stand it. Like, I just, I can't stand it. And I just feel like, um, and I, particularly in the HR tech space, we are not responsive and proactive enough in dealing with these type of issues. And the thing that I think happened 
with this whole encryption piece, I think you had a couple of the major players. I'm not going to name no names, mm -hmm. but you know who they are. We had a couple of the major players who stopped doing it, and then it just trickled on down so that the mid-levels started doing it, and then the True. small ones were just like, oh, we're just not going to do it at all because they probably couldn't afford to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So now it's become industry practice, but who authorized it in the first place? And to your point, who's going to tell the story about like why this happened that way? Because I worked in work and worked in security mm -hmm. industry as well as restaurant. And so some of our employee data, when you start dealing with point of sale systems, co-mingles with customer data a whole different animal and we run we've run into the same problem in our implementations where the data is not secure coming from one system to another and that that little transition moment and all it takes is you know one good hack yep. and they got they got everything and I'm not gonna be the one sending out memos to employees about the fact that you know their data got hacked at work Thank you. No. Um, so, yeah, I just I, I think at some point in time, one of one or two of the major players in the HR tech space pulled it because probably it probably the maintenance of it must have got too expensive. It has to be a financial aspect as to why the decision was made. And then all the one all the rest of them were like, oh, someone's not doing it. Well, then we just not going to do it either no more. Yeah. What say what say you, techie guy? I mean what, what do you think? I, mean, I don't I don't know about uh I don't know too much about the HR space to be honest in terms of But I but I don't even think it's an HR thing. I'm right? I'm thinking I'm just wondering I mean like, I feel like I feel like people are um I'm seeing it in more and more more stuff, I mean on my in my world or the world's on tra circles I'm traveling in. Uh, just because, I mean, you're seeing a lot more um, HTTPS, like making sure things are transferred across the, you know, like protocols are being used anyway. And so uh, I, I don't know, I'd have to, I guess, sit in on one of these meetings or something and maybe they think you already have certain um, protocols in place for transferring data anyway. So them actually encrypting it in transit is unnecessary because you're already going across some secure lines. Um, and so it seems like ex extra work. Um, that would be something, uh, maybe some people are just doing it for the upsell, the upwork, uh, because then you can extend that roadmap a little bit and now you're paying a little lot more. I don't, I'm not sure. I'd have to know more about uh, the specific situation, but I am seeing, cause like, I know WhatsApp, they encrypt in transit. I think they do end-to-end -end encryption and a couple other. So it's starting to come back. If it has gone away, it's starting to come back more and become expected, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that even in the like marketing space, you're seeing that you can increase like any commerce. You can see that like, if your marketing reflects that you're using these secure practices, you actually can increase like sales and customer satisfaction, things of that nature. People are starting to become more aware of what needs to be happening with their data in terms of security and um, they're demanding it. Yeah, totally. No, so it's, it, but it's interesting. I mean, they're demanding this security, but as I was kind of alluding to in the show, there's still this dissonance between behavior and what actually happens after we do what we do. So, I mean, what do you think is the, the solution to getting people to pay more attention to behavior? M my thought is that it will, we're, we're just not scared of it enough yet, and mm -hmm. it'll take something fairly cata catastrophic for us to wake up and realize just how much of our own data we're giving away, but that might be too doom and gloom. What say you? Um, I think it's a combination. Um, so on the one hand, I think that because there hasn't been, uh, what was that Die Hard movie, the fire one, the one where there was like, the, like, they hacked America and shut everything down. I don't think we've had any, what do they call it, fire sale? We haven't had any, like, like you said, any huge catastrophic events that have affected the small person. Most of the time when we hear about these hacks, although 
small businesses are most likely to get hacked and within six months be completely shut down when they do get hacked. Um, we only hear about Facebooks and stuff like that. So we go, hey, that's not us, that's Yahoo. I'm, you know, Joe Smith over here. It doesn't really matter. It's not affecting me. And as long as we don't get that email, we're not too worried. But also, we're kind of conditioned almost with our hacking. So everybody is like, oh, my identity may be stolen at some point. I'm gonna get an email alert at some point. Someone's gonna hack my card at some point. So much is, so many things are happening now, we're almost desensitized to it anyway. And so I think in order for us to really, as a people like really be concerned about it, we have to start affecting people um, individually in a larger way than my identity, my credit, something like that. Like the person who gets their identity stolen is very serious about cybersecurity moving forward, right? Yeah. Um, then the B or the flip side to that is f from um, from the developer and a cyber professional standpoint, I, I don't know that in as industry professionals, we think enough about the end user. So uh, one of the things that I really focus on is like, usable security and authentication so like that's the software that i'm working on now which is using more graphical passwords and so we have different technologies that are in the research but we don't see them implemented in practice in industry either because they will require a little bit additional work on the end user or they'll be a little bit different and um people are lazy people are people will give up privacy and security for comfort Right, yep. like nine times out of ten. So all the things exactly that you like, said, I, yep. I was like, got my whole list. That's right. I was like, you know, you're talking about reusing passwords, writing them down, um, weak passwords, things of that nature. Because at the end of the day, if it's easy, if it clicks in a button, if it clicks in two buttons, and so that's how you get a lot of these like single sign-on and stuff like that. And so, but I think mm -hmm. that that's the shift that needs to be made. Okay, we have these legacy systems. Maybe we're not able to get um, single sign-on. How can we have these lower tiered options that still make it easier for the end user to be safer? And so that's kind of where I focus my research and product dev on, which is how can we make it beneficial financially for consumers and easy for the end user? Because if you don't marry that intersection, you kind of get what we have now, which is a lot of people want too much privacy and trusting too much and being sorry afterwards or you have people that just aren't doing anything at all and that's also either one is bad yeah thought sarah i do not have anything to add this is why um i like to talk first on the tech issues when paul is here because oh, no. he comes in he comes in and he takes all the goodies it's like all it's like the, the kid who takes all of candy off the porch Halloween. He's that kid. He takes all the goodies. It's good though. It's good though. Yeah. No. I mean, this is this is your. This and I got the sugar with me. <laughs> you can really know. Know. <laughs> I can't. I don't know why. She said uh, he can't. takes all the goodies. I was like, man, I am sitting here with two pounds of sugar. But uh, all the goodies. Yeah. All yeah, so but, I think, but yeah, this is your bag. So this is where it needs to be. Right. I mean, but we right. we're just not talking about it. I don't I don't hear it in HR. Like I was telling Paul, like the end of last year, I'm like, yeah, there's there's immense opportunity to just come in just on a purely educational standpoint and educate people about why half of this stuff is important, um, and largely because of some of what I was saying. On the on the cast about this prevalence of you know a lot of these systems going to mobile, mm -hmm. we really have well, yeah, I'm, yeah. I you mean, know like there's are, no way of knowing really yeah there isn't and and like I said in the comments on the show you people are absolutely screenshotting stuff their work related emails and their work you know things in the HRIS mobile. Like, no, it's happening. Trust and know and believe that it's happening every single day, every single day, several times a day. It's absolutely happening. Um, and here's what's funny. I've seen, and I'll admit it, I'm guilty of this too. Like, I've, I've, we encourage it. 
you know, it's like, oh, you're, we posted your benefits information, you know, your group number for your new health benefits is posted in the app and you take a screenshot and save it in your phone. Like we encourage some of that stuff, again, to make it easier for the end user to be able to do that. And we don't think about the security implications of that. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah, we do have to start to give more thought to that and about what things we give access to and how we encourage employees, you know, to do and act, you know, interact with what's on in the app versus what you do on a on a desktop or um, your work computer because we just don't have those those controls the way they did anymore. And we want to make it easy for them. We want we of course as HR people want to get out of the transactional things of having to have employees email us or or call right. us with changes to their information we want them to be able to do all of that stuff themselves and we want to be to be able to do it when it's convenient for them versus normal business hours that you know work for us so all of that plays a factor in in how this happens and over time we get more lax and more lax and we start realizing that there's more and more things that people can be doing on their own and we just let you know we let the guards down and then suddenly it you open yourself up to all kinds of liabilities and you think about that i mean your hris is in addition to personal you know just your regular personal information it's personal health information in there mm -hmm. your spouse your dependents your beneficiaries which is normally other members of your family and in some cases you have to collect social security numbers on those individuals in order to be able to update your beneficiaries if you have life insurance through your job or, or something like that. So it's not just your data. It, you know, it's suddenly right. it's, it's your kids' socials, it's your kids' birthdays. Like suddenly all of that can have the potential to become compromised. It's there's just so much risk with that. And and I agree we gotta be talking about it in the tech spaces i think it would be cool for there to be like a hr hackathon <laughs> to see to see you know um some of these hackers in here and show how easy it is or it's not like we would hope that it, it would not be easy but how easy it is or it's not to hack some of these systems i think it will wake some people up to realizing where the risks are and perhaps um, putting back in some of those safeguards that have gotten taken away because it's, it ultimately, you know, your, your work site is not Facebook. It's not, um, it, it shouldn't be, you know, that easy. And to Paul's point, we have to find the balance between making it easy for the user and protecting their data at the same time. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, and it's even stuff like, I mean, I've seen people snapping like, where they sign in in a building like the actual keypad the actual like it's even educating people from a new hire perspective like you can't be doing that or you can't be taking snapchats in a patient's room yeah yep <laughs> like hi hipaa um amongst other things mm -hmm. like just just those things alone are you know issues and breaches in and of itself so yeah but Flipping it just slightly, what I don't know how true it is, but what do y'all think of this 10 year challenge and the fact that there's a possibility that the government is using or Zuckerberg's giving it away ah. for facial yeah. recognition? Like, is this what we doing right now? Did y'all get duped? Is this the okie doke? <laughs> you know, I, when you open the show talking about, you know, is there any privacy left? And I think we're getting closer and closer to the point where there's not. And then there's the conspiracy theorist in me who argues that we have it in the first place because it's not like sure. government monitoring of our movements and the things that we do is new concept. It's not like, you know, the internet came, Facebook came along. We just made it easier for them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they were monitoring library cards back in the day. The census is a form of, of monitoring and tracking. So um, 
you know, and taxes, like, you know, all, all of those sorts of things. They, that's how they find you to know where it is that you work, all of that. So it's not like the monitoring is new. Um, I'm more concerned. I'm, I guess I'm slightly less concerned about the government than I am who else you know, like the, yeah. the the whole dark web concept, like who else is is possibly getting access to this information? But privacy has always been a slight fallacy for us. Um, it it just has. So I can't get but so um, upset about it. And and here's the thing with with the Facebook ten year challenge, just stuff already in there. Like most right. people are taking one of the very early photos that they posted on Facebook and then, you know, their current profile picture. That's what I did. So that was already, they already had that. If so, if they were looking for it again, I might've made it easier for them by, you know, showing that babes don't age. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but it, it was already in there. So all of that information, you know, was already accessible to them. I, and I agree. And I've started to stop myself from doing the quizzes and those sorts of things, because I definitely think that's a greater, just as great as not a greater risk, because you have no idea who these um, companies are that are putting together these little quizzes. And like you said, you, you go put in information to find your Myers-Briggs type and then they want to know what your grandmama maiden name was like suddenly like all the normal security questions come like what you need to know that for that don't got nothing to do with my mind right so it's like that you know they're sneaking in stuff and and you're giving access to them in the process so those sorts of things I try to be mindful about watching out for and without being too like you know overbearing try to remind my friends just be careful mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff but the the governments they watching and if we stop doing this they just going to invent another way because they want to be watching so true true i mean i agree i yeah. concur you concur so I concur. I, i'm gonna go another way i mean this is something that i did and and now, I mean, I don't feel, I don't know how I feel about it. I mean, I'm happy for the information I got from it, but I wonder, you know, what all did I give away? So there's been a lot of talk too about, um, you know, this, the, the surge of everybody doing the Ancestry.com stuff yeah. and uh, oh, yeah. 23 and Me. So I'm not gonna lie, I, I bit that, you know, I, I was interested because mm -hmm. look, you know, I mean, yes, I'm from the West Indies. It's all good, but it's like, there's a lot of stuff going on over here. So I'm just like, well, I'd like to know, like, what is it, you know? And I mean, yeah. I've found some family. So this is positive. Like I've, I've connected with some people I wouldn't have otherwise, but to the point of the critics, I mean, is there about to be a, a Janine clone somewhere? Are they using this to for stem cells and shit? Like, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. What are your feelings on this? I, I don't I don't know how to feel. Like it was like after I did it and spit in the damn tube and got got all happy about my results that this report came out. I'm like, damn, I really did just give them my DNA. Like, okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Go ahead, Paul. I, I, I'm, I'm torn. Because, like, I, I don't know. When I heard it, I was like, oh, that's really cool. But my first thought was, like, super conspiracy theorist. And I was just like, they're getting everybody's stuff so they can figure out how to wipe people out. But that was like me. I was like, this is bio-warfare. I didn't even think about cloning. Like, that was my first thought. It was like, and now we can figure out what a majority or certain population has. But um, I don't know. I haven't done any research into it, so I couldn't. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't done it, though. I mean, yeah, for, for all it's worth, mm -hmm. I'm black, black, blackity black with, with spots right. of all sorts of things. So I guess if they're trying to white, I guess I'll just be going back to the motherland, basically. I'm yeah. not black. Yeah, they'll just ship me back. See, I and that's my thing. So 
I want to, I mean, you know, me being, me being on the lighter scale of, of blackness, I, I need to, I feel like I need to prove, you know, my, I, I want to know. And then I also feel like I need to put a stamp on the percentage of my, my Wakandan heritage um, to make sure, you know, I can get in when the time comes. Um, so this is for what that I was reason, <laughs> yeah, for that reason, I've been super, I, you know, they don't let a lot of light skinned people in Wakanda, so I got to make sure my papers are orderly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I definitely um, have been super curious about it. My husband and I joke all the time because I'm like, I bet if I took ancestry DNA, I'm really black than you. Like, you don't know. I really am. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm, there's been so much coverage about it and there just seems to be this kind of air of mystery about what they do with your samples and your data after it's all over. I need them to clean that up a little bit before I'm willing to, to give up the goods. My mom did it though. My mom did, she found a cousin, um, from, you know, that she did not know existed Super um, cool. because yeah well my grandfather my mother's father he was one of nine mm. very very all very very fair skin but he had several brothers and sisters who passed and they have you know lost touch with them because they became white people socially and could not associate with their family anymore and so she found cousins through that uh, that she didn't know existed. So that was a super cool experience um, to be able to, you know, reconnect with those people. Um, one of them was shocked to find out that um, there was there was black people in their family, so that didn't work out too well. Um, but the, but in oh, the oh. other instances, yeah, is it that you can? We'll I just keep about thinking that. about that. That's a whole nother. That's a whole nother. That's a whole nother. Like, show. Show. Like, yeah. whole nother so I feel like we, talk we, about we could do a whole on nother show on black that on just that. And I feel like yeah, I feel that. like I want a conspiracy theorist show where we just throw out all the. Th I feel like I, I see y'all. <laughs> y'all are my people. We want to talk yeah. about some conspiracies. But seeing as though we have like eight minutes left before Zoom okay. kicks us off, we should de I should definitely answer Paul's question. So what was your question to me on the show, sir, with regard to my eyeshadow and smokes and, and Oh, I was oh. joking. Okay, okay. I get I, all right, so what happened? I got on. Good, we did. I got on and you were talking like super excited about this pothead uh makeup <laughs> on. <laughs> And then you were like, but I'm not a pothead. And Sarah was like, come through a smile. I was just like, okay. And then you were like, well, I'm not a pothead. I was like, mm, that's not like somebody who got a bunch of edibles in the house trying to play like she not about that life. But that's cool. So first of all, firstly, I need you to be all up out my business. I'm going to get sister <laughs> Get out my business. Don't be putting my shit on Front Street. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> Good dog. Like, real holler, won't they? I was they? like, Paul, like, how do you know my life? <laughs> I did it. Hit dogs will holler, though. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, shortly, I, I was one of those kids that was like, I don't do any of this. My dad's a narcotic detective. He'll know. So that was my adolescence. I just never, ever indulged in any of these things. But now I'm getting grown and New York State is on its way to legalizing. So <laughs> I am not a pothead, <laughs> but I do, I, you know, in the realm of conspiracies, I've always found it very interesting that the U.S. has patents on cannabis for a number of things that would help people. But yeah. we're pumping them with pharma shit, right? And so this was the time that I, I just kind of rewired everything in my head. Like, wait a minute, why would we have a patent on something that's absolutely horrible? Like, why mm -hmm. would we? You know, and so no, I um, think they spent all this. The conspiracy theorist in me says they spent all this time. I think it's a combination of two things. It's my own conspiracy theory. I think it's a combination of two things. I think they took those patents and they spent time developing things and the oils and all of that kind of stuff so that they could figure out how they could grow 
weed in America that's as strong as the weed that comes from other countries because the, the really good weed comes from places where black and brown people are and we're not going to let black and brown people give us so rich so th it took them time to be able to do that I think we're crossing that threshold and now they're like all right let's go ahead and legalize and then the second thing is they still have not been able to replace repeal health care reform and when you get deeper into the rollout of the 10-year plan of health care reform, even though there have been a lot of delays, you start to get to universal health care standards, universal billing and medical codes, and we, it's, it's the after show. That will completely fuck up our health care industry when you start doing that. So they're not going to be able to make money over there, yeah. so they got to figure out how they can make money over here. So this mm. thing that they've taken and they've criminalized, they now have to figure out how to enterprise in order to be able to keep the economy stable if they cannot repeal health care reform. Because once we stabilize and say you can only charge this, this much for an MRI, you can only charge this much for tier three pharmaceuticals, then it's those those Carriers ain't making no money no more. We gonna have our economy sir. If we oh, you broke up a little bit there. I missed the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah. We so got, we we got four thing. minutes, but um, four minutes. So that's we could get so deep on that. So yeah, that said, you can because I just saw that Dame Dash uh, interview on it. <laughs> I enjoy, uh, right. I, I do enjoy a good CBD cookie every once and again, a little CBD brownie, you know, just a mellow. Oh. Yeah, that's nice. You know, Hi. Hi. it is what it is. And, and quite frankly, I find that the more and more I hang around with other people, everybody's dabbling just a bit. We'll smoke here, a little edible here before the party. So I'm in good company. It's all good. So right. the cat's out of bag. I keep edibles. In fact, there are two upstairs right now. I might indulge after I get off here. Thank you, Paul. We should do I'm, another I'm, after show. You know? we, should do, we should do an after, after show that's not recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get mellow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how Janine gets when she gets yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, it's great. I'm glad I got to talk with you ladies, brilliant yeah. ladies. Super honored once again. So next yeah. week, we're all on the cocooning stuff, which you guys probably were like, what the hell is that? But I'll explain, and we'll have a great conversation about it. But oh, thank wow. you for being thank you, here everybody. thank you everybody for watching and we will yes. see you back here next thursday bye all right till next time y'all till next time